Archivist Journal, Megalodont, by Archivist Signor Caliban. Winter, 521 CE. Subject C has moved within his enclosure all day. He's resting on the ground, staring intently at the glass surrounding him, for no discernible reason to us. Even for evening supper, he's yet to move an inch. It's quite blight. As the body stench has accumulated more over time, he just stares, unmoving. This came as quite the shock to Francis and I, as Subject C usually becomes frenzied when brought near a corpse, yet nothing. Late into the night, Subject A rose from her slumber and released a deafening screech, waking every single being in the facility easily. The shaking floor somehow stirred even Subject C to upright position, looking attentively towards the Alpha. Throughout our week studying the relationship between an alpha megalodont and the subordinate megalodont has brought many interesting questions in our hands. While not appearing to be reasonably intelligent creatures, they have a strong sense of social hierarchy and their place in society, if it would be called that. Subordinate megalodonts tend to pay close attention to the alpha of their territory for reasons we cannot understand. Subject A has expressed the impressive ability to bring a creature as lazy as Subject C to his feet, a feat instrumentable to us meager scholars. As it has been a notably long time since Subject C has eaten, he finally began the to motion towards his now hours old dinner, yet Subject A had seemed to deny this, taking the meal for herself. Astounding, isn't it? Faris wouldn't even believe me if I told him twice. Once the excitement had died down, I returned to slumber. They, the realization has hit that we had lack additional food for our dear subjects. Last night's meal for Subject C was the last body on hand, unfortunately. It is winter. Pathfinders tend to be shaky during this time of year. It's more difficult to find gullible, bright-eyed, hopeful ones. During last winter, we prepared a surplus of bodies in preparation for this. The winter, however, we became careless. Too much time spent on experimentation and studying, of course. But, I do not want to end my studies here, and a megalodon's appetite is marvelous. I'll contemplate my options, I'm determined to see these experiments through to the end. I'm writing once more, a few hours past my previous entry. I prepared a new meal for my subjects. I still need to wash myself first, as I do not want the smell of blood luring them towards myself instead of their meal. Despite this being all I can provide for now, I'm happy to say it will at least satisfy Subject A. She's my primary research target at the moment. After all, surely her subordinates will understand. And if not, I've seen beautifully gruesome combat between megalodonts, almost akin to mankind's scuffles. Truly a fascinating spectacle to witnesses. I fed the last of my food supply to Subject A, dropping the body into the enclosure as she did last night. She did consumed it happily. As the other two subjects watched. Oh, so there's two of them. Alright. I used this opportunity to gain the best I possibly could to muster at the coarse coral along her back. A beautiful natural weapon capable of slaughtering hundreds of pathfinders within mere moments. Its ability to launch almost needle-like projectiles at such high speeds, beautifully lethal. It mainly occurs when the Megalodon is under high stress as a lat-ditch defense mechanism. I fear I may have stared l too long though, as the other subordinates seemed more interested in me than ever before. I made sure to engage in a swift exit. There is something marvelous about these creatures, some sort of mankind-like understanding between each other. Yet to us, they are simply considered monsters. You all fail to see its social prowess without not even a consideration of the possibilities. What if we were able to exploit this hierarchy for our own purpose? For my purpose. For your own purpose.